EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, January 29th. President Obama delivered his State of the Union address this week. We'll take a look at his game plan for 2014. The Supreme Court has granted a compromise to the Little Sisters of the Poor, the latest on the HHS mandate victory. Pro-lifers in San Francisco hit the streets for the Walk for Life West Coast and we'll take you there. And were you shocked by what you saw at the Grammys this year? Stay tuned for a debate about what the awards ceremony says about our culture. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick in for Colleen Carroll Campbell, who's on maternity leave. Looking at news now, the big story here in Washington, reaction to the president's State of the Union address. Today, Republicans swiftly rejected the president's vow to act on his own if Congress won't help him close the income gap among Americans. Democrats said Obama laid out a bold, proactive plan. In his fifth State of the Union, Obama urged lawmakers to create jobs, overhaul immigration laws, and fight climate change. He said he would act alone if lawmakers won't compromise. But America does not stand still, and neither will I. So wherever and whenever I can take steps without legislation to expand opportunity for more American families, that's what I'm going to do. Washington Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers delivered the Republican response. She said her party wants to empower Americans, not the government to close the gap. The president talks a lot about income inequality, but the real gap we face today is one of opportunity inequality. And with this administration's policies, that gap has become far too wide. For some State of the Union analysis, we have Michael Warren, staff writer at the Weekly Standard. Good to have you back, Michael. Thanks. Is the State of the Union address as important as it was back in the day when you, that's all you could see on television? Now you have a lot of choices. Yeah, I, I think that it, if you take the opportunity as a president, uh, you're on several of the news networks, you've, you're in this big, great hall in the Capitol, and, and you're really speaking to the American people. If you take that opportunity, it can be a big deal. But in the last several decades, really, it's become a laundry list. Here's the things that I want to do, and Congress, please uh, uh, help me get those done. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't really, and I would say that, uh, that this president really didn't take the opportunity, I think, to lay out either a bold vision or say to some of his uh, opponents here in Washington that, uh, hey, here's where we agree, here's uh, where we can you know, get something done. He tried to come across very forcefully, like I'm in charge and I'm going to get things done. Isn't there a danger of that being seen as arrogance or cockiness? I, I think in, in, if you look at the content of where he was, I, I would say it was a, a, some misplaced machismo. Uh, he said, you know, for, for instance, on Iran, he said, if you, uh, if you uh, bring the sanctions bill to me, I will veto them. Uh, I don't know if he or his administration has ever spoken so forcefully to, say, uh, the, the government in Iran and the regime in Iran in the way that he spoke to uh, members of Congress. So it comes off, I think, a little tenured and, and perhaps not in the way that uh, he would like it to be, which is he's uh, in charge, he's, he's, he's in control of his presidency. Uh, it came off, I, I think, as, a, as, a, as, as tenured. Do you think he changed anyone's mind? It's hard to listen to the address and see where he would have changed anybody's mind. I mean, he, he never sort of stepped to, say, Republicans or, or conservatives and said, uh, look, we disagree on a lot of different things, but here's one or two places where we do agree, and this is why I think you should agree with me on, on these issues. Uh, he never really did that. But at the same time, he never really laid out a bold vision for his view and, 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 and sort of stood up there and said, look, this is where I stand. This is, you know, a, a big government liberalism that that does these things and improves the the lives of Americans. And this is why uh, uh, you should support me on this. There was none of that. It was more just that laundry list of here's uh, here's what I'd like you to do. And he, the year ahead, of course, will tell. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Well, now some of the other stories the EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. In the Deep South, snow plows and winter gear are getting a real workout. A rare snowstorm Tuesday paralyzed Southerners, leaving thousands of workers stranded in churches, grocery stores, wherever they could find shelter. Students camped out with teachers in school gyms. Commuters abandoned cars along the highway. The governors of seven southern states declared a state of emergency, including North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory. Uh, we've got to make sure that uh, people use a safe method of heating 
And um, I also want all of us to watch out for our neighbors. Farther north and across the upper Midwest, wind chills plummeted to 30, even 40 degrees below zero. Now, people in those cities are much more accustomed to the cold, but it's cold enough to cancel classes and prompt many in the nation to really look forward to spring. The House has passed an almost $100 billion a year compromise farm bill that would make small cuts to food stamps and continue generous subsidies to many American farmers. The Senate is also expected to pass the five-year bill, then send it on to the president. That measure would continue strong subsidies for major crops, while some subsidies would be shifted to insurance programs. The deadline for filing briefs with the U.S. Supreme Court passed at midnight for groups who want to have a say in two high court cases regarding the Health and Human Services birth control mandate. In another case, the court decided with the Little Sisters of the Poor in their challenge to the mandate. The Little Sisters won't have to sign a government form authorizing their insurance company to provide birth control to their employees. The high court's order protects 400 other Catholic organizations who receive health coverage from Christian Brothers Services. EWTN CEO Michael Warsaw called the decision very encouraging, but he says it has no direct impact on the network's own lawsuit. Broncos and Seahawks fans descend upon New Jersey Meadowlands on Sunday for the Super Bowl, but so will an influx of human sex traffickers trying to cash in on the crowds at this massive Sadly, sporting event. That was the focus of a congressional hearing this week, where witnesses testified that more needs to be done to protect young girls and boys from sexual exploitation. Kids are surrounded by media messages, and oftentimes these media messages are of sexualized women, objectified women. And we kind of live in this culture that normalizes this sexual objectification and exploitation of women. Holly Smith testifying before the committee chaired by Congressman Chris Smith. In other football news this evening, Northwestern University athletes are announcing that they are forming the first labor union for college sportsmen, one they hope will eventually represent players at private schools nationwide. The players' reasons for wanting a union protection against future medical expenses related to sports injuries, and a response to the complaint that college athletes' graduation rates are abysmally low. Student athletes don't have a voice. They don't have a seat at the table. The current model res resembles a dictatorship where the NCAA places these rules and regulations on these students without their input or without the negotiation. And now to Egypt, where ousted President Mohamed Morsi appeared at a new trial on Tuesday. In the courtroom, you can see him pacing and shouting at his judges from a soundproof, glass-encased metal cage. Morsi is on trial with dozens of co-defendants on charges rooted in the 2011 escape of more than 20,000 inmates from Egyptian prisons, including Morsi himself and other Muslim Brotherhood members. That was during the early days of the 18-day uprising against ousted President Hosni Mubarak. Egypt's neighbor, Jordan, plans to enforce a Western-style smoking ban in restaurants, cafes, and other public places. It sparked a heated debate. That ban would have the government revoking the licenses of all 6,000 coffee shops that serve hookah and tobacco products by the end of this year. Jordanian business owners and smokers say the ban goes against a pastime that's been ingrained in their culture from the time of the Ottoman Empire. Nearly half of Jordan's men smoke on a daily basis. Ukraine no longer has a prime minister. Mykola Arazov has stepped down after months of national protest. Recently, local clergy have taken to the streets, singing and praying and offering comfort to the protesters. Many of the injured demonstrators have taken sanctuary in the local St. Michael's Monastery. Police are searching an Italian mountainside for a precious relic from Blessed John Paul II. It is a cloth stained with the late Pope's blood. The relic was stolen last week from the sanctuary of a church, which is the first sanctuary in Europe dedicated to John Paul II. That church is in a mountain area that was one of JP2's favorite spots for hiking and skiing. You know, it was 15 years ago this week that Blessed John Paul II made his last visit to the U.S. He came to St. Louis and he talked about the United States' responsibility to be an example of true democracy. The Pope met at that time with civil rights pioneer Rosa Park and prayed with a rabbi. It was the first occasion for a Jewish rabbi to participate in a Catholic prayer service with the Pope. Blessed John Paul II will be canonized April 27th along with Blessed John the 23rd.
They say a picture is worth a thousand words, but is a prayer book worth $12 million? That is the starting price for the 16th century prayer book with lavish illustrations. The bidding starts today at Christie's Auction House in New York. Teachers and students all across the country are rallying for Catholic education in their communities. This week marks the 40th annual National Catholic Schools Week. At Chamberlain Elementary here in Washington, students from Catholic and public schools came together today promoting choice in education. EWTN News Nightly's Wyatt Spencer is there. Wyatt? Brian, for the last four years, Catholic schools have shared Catholic Schools Week with National School Choice Week. It's a non-religious, non-partisan initiative meant to promote the variety of school options. For some, that means more competition to the typical parish school. For others, it's an opportunity to highlight Catholic schools as models. Today's Put Kids First rally shows you just how many options families face when deciding where to send their children to school. Classes from public schools, charter schools, magnet schools, and private schools all packed in to Friendship Chamberlain's gym to hear a variety of speakers talk about the positive impact of school choice. Former WNBA star and mother of two, Lisa Leslie, told News Nightly sorting through all of the choices starts with informed parents. I think parents are the key because uh, children don't know what to decide for themselves and parents really have to get behind educational choice, really do their homework and figure out what's the best learning tools and positions for their kids. And one of those options, Catholic schools. Among the crowd, students and teachers from St. Augustine's Catholic School in Washington. What I like about St. Augustine is um, the education they give us and um, the teachers and how respectful and nice they are. Catholic schools this week have been active in highlighting their values. Masses, open houses, and other events are promoting the theme of Catholic schools as communities of faith, knowledge, and service. It's these values supported by students, teachers, and parents that many say will help Catholic schools stand out from the crowd. At our school, we pray four times a day, and so having parents support at home is um, just as important because our students are learning their Catholic identity and also that God is an integral part of their lives. Many of the organizers at today's rally are also hoping to get the attention of lawmakers here in D.C. A lot of the students that you saw in that gym are part of scholarship programs that are linked to federal funding. But money aside, educators here say they hope the most important voice that people listen to is the voice of parents. In Washington, Wyatt Spencer, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, we go to Rome for the latest from our Vatican correspondent, Alan Holdren. Stay with us. Pope Francis held his weekly Wednesday audience in Rome today, reflecting on the sacrament of confirmation. He spoke about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. After those remarks, he greeted thousands of pilgrims from all over the world, including a group from South Dakota. Alan Holdren is our eyes and ears at the Vatican, our Rome correspondent here on EWTN News Nightly. And Alan, in our parishes, we've been praying for Christian unity. This is something very dear to the heart of Pope Francis. What has he been doing on this issue? Well, Brian, just this last Saturday, he met with uh, leaders of other Christian confessions, uh, Orthodox, Anglicans, Protestants, at the Basilica of St. Paul's Outside the Walls. There they gathered at the tomb of St. Paul himself to pray for Christian unity. Uh, in his homily, the Pope spoke about the, uh, the church that Christ founded, and he founded only one church. And he, he really stressed that there in front of uh, all of these other leaders of Christian communities. And, uh, you know, this has really become a hallmark of his pontificate, is reaching out to people. He's always talking about this culture of dialogue, a culture of encounter that he wants to create. And you can really feel that in events like this one. I think we're going to see this even more when the Pope goes to the Holy Land uh, just this next May. Were you able to see any kind of feedback from those visiting the Pope in this uh, get-together, whether this idea of Christian unity, whether we're getting any closer to it? Well, I think everybody's open to speaking about uh, what gets in the way, the things that, that uh, all of these confessions, denominations have in common, and also the things that set them apart. So I think Pope Francis just wants to, to open up this platform and make sure that the, the channels of dialogue are open and that they can continue forward on a process that, that's gone for years, if not uh, decades. All right, Alan Holdren in a rainy Rome, and you probably haven't seen the cover of the Rolling Stone magazine. The Pope's picture is on the cover. What you have seen, though, is an, an interesting depiction of Pope Francis in graffiti near you. 
Yeah, that's right. Just uh, in the Borgo neighborhood, which is the neighborhood just outside the Vatican, a local artist by the name of Mauro Palota uh, created this uh, work of graffiti, which is, it depicts the Pope as a superhero. He said uh, to us earlier this afternoon when we interviewed him that uh, this is his depiction of the Super Papa, a Superman Pope. Um, he wanted to bring him down to earth though and give him his simple shoes, he said, also his black briefcase. You can see coming out of the briefcase there's a little piece of a scarf. That's from the, uh, the soccer team that the Pope roots for back in Buenos Aires called San Lorenzo. Oh. And uh, so you can see that this is uh, sort of a, a very comical depiction of the Pope, but a very positive one as well. Yeah, and we'll talk more about the Rolling Stone magazine article in just a little bit here on EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Alan reporting from Rome this evening. Civil war has rocked Syria for almost three years now. Rebels are trying to overthrow the country's president, Bashar al-Assad. For the first time, a delegation of Christian leaders has come to the United States pleading for peace. Jason Calvi joins us now with more. Jason. Brian, the Christian leaders met today with senators and State Department officials. They've also been speaking at think tanks and parishes, and the picture they paint is dire. We face a situation which, if it is not dealt with, could lead to the extinction of Christians in Syria. The sounds of Syria's civil war fill the ears of Syrian Orthodox Bishop John Kawak. We get used to another kind of rain. Now uh, the sky is raining uh, mortar bombs. He's one of five Christians coming to America to ask for help. To pray for, for us, to pray for Syria. Syria was once a welcome home for Christians. Now they're caught in the crossfire. We've had many Christians killed, we've had kidnapping, and of course ethnic cleansing. Christians are being forced to leave their communities and flee elsewhere. These Orthodox and Protestants are about 6,000 miles from Syria, but cell phones keep them connected to home, and they browse ancient Syrian manuscripts at Catholic University of America. But come tomorrow, they'll be back home shepherding their flock. And peace discussions are ongoing, happening right now at the UN uh, in Geneva. And Brian, so far, uh, representatives of President Bashar al-Assad and representatives of the, of the opposition haven't been able to agree on much. Were there any Catholic bishops involved in this delegation? There were. There was supposed to be one, a Catholic bishop from Aleppo, but unfortunately, because of violence in his area, he wasn't able to make it. All right. Thank you, Jason. Next up. A lot of people are still talking about the Grammys. We're going to talk with some experts about what the award ceremony says about our culture. Stay with us. Musicians strutted the red carpet Sunday for the 56th annual Grammy Awards. Daft Punk won Album of the Year for Random Access Memories. Lord took home Song of the Year for Royals. But when Queen Latifah took to the stage, the Grammys went from being an award ceremony to a wedding ceremony with 33 couples, including some same-sex couples. Do you each declare that you take each other as spouses? By the power vested in me by the state of California, I now pronounce you a married Joining us tonight is Ryan Anderson, a fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and Dr. Day Gardner, president of the National Black Pro-Life Union. Welcome to both of you. And you both have music backgrounds. Ryan, why would you take a music award ceremony and turning it into a wedding ceremony? You know, it, it's interesting. They, didn't, they weren't really celebrating marriage. They were celebrating the redefinition of marriage. And this is part of a broader trend of Hollywood and the music industry over the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, not to celebrate what marriage is, a permanent, exclusive, monogamous relationship of a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, a mother and a father, but it was a celebration of consensual adult love. And that's not the same thing as marriage. Day, you were a great singer for quite a few years. I'm sure you dreamed of going to the Grammys. Would you want to have gone uh, to that course. ceremony? You know what, 23 years I was a singer, and every singer, anyone, everyone who's ever wanted a record deal, you know, dreams of getting to the Grammys. You know, but this is not the Grammys. This is not the Grammys that I dreamed about. This is really just, has, it's now part of the dismant dismantling uh, the American culture and, and our nation. And I think that's a really sad thing. I, I thought it was really very badly done. And in poor taste. So, Ryan, what should we as Christians do about this? How should we react to this? 
I think two things, and it's neither of which entail hand-wringing and kind of condemning. The first is to make the argument for marriage, what it is, why it matters, and why we shouldn't be redefining marriage. And then the second is to really champion those cultural forms that can communicate that message best. Um, it's not really their fault that they control the organs of culture. They control the music awards. It's our fault. We need more Christians in the music industry, in the film industry. Christians like you, Dr. Gardner, what would you add to that? I would say that we serve a very powerful and wise God. We all know that. And mm -hmm. as Christians, let's stand up for the things that we know that are true, the things that we know that are real, and that's who, those are the things that are God. So we have to really um, tie into our biblical uh, beliefs and know that we are one of millions, millions of Christians in this nation, and we have to stand up. Dr. Day Gardner, Ryan Anderson, thanks for joining thanks us, for both us. of you. Well, in case you've just joined us, let's take a quick look at stories the EWTN News Nightly team is bringing you tonight. People here in Washington and all across the country are responding to President Obama's fifth State of the Union address. He laid out his plan for 2014, urging Congress to create jobs for more Americans, reform immigration policy, and fight climate change. And he said he would act alone if lawmakers won't compromise. A rare ice and snowstorm blanketing the Deep South the weather had people abandoning cars on Tuesday, even had some children stranded in schools. Seven southern governors declared a state of emergency. A delegation of Christian leaders from war-torn Syria pleading for peace here in Washington. Today they met with top U.S. leaders. They head home tomorrow. Something fresh and new this evening. We're looking at what people like you are saying on social media. EWTN News Nightly producer Susie Pinto has that for us. Susie, what's trending? Well, today, Brian, lots of people talking about the State of the Union address. Uh, last night, many people were weighing in on Twitter. Uh, lots of positive remarks, also lots of criticism. But one nice thing was a tweet by the Department of Defense of Sergeant First Class Corey Remsburg, who was sitting next to Michelle Obama yesterday. It was a nice sign of unity and something we all can agree on. I'm sure this administration, as tech savvy as it is, realizes that the president wasn't just playing to Congress or the millions watching on television. Social media is a big part of their strategy. Absolutely. And they do. They keep in touch with people online all the time through their different social media accounts. They definitely are always talking and getting feedback from the public. And of course at the Vatican, social media has become a big part of the pontificate of Pope Francis. And now he's on the front page of the Rolling Stone, the cover of the Rolling Stone. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of chatter about that. Oh, absolutely. Already we're seeing that picture uh, going viral online. Lots of people sharing it and talking about it. We saw one interesting post that said um, they had a picture of the Pope on the cover saying, you are the rock on which we will build our role. So definitely some criticism about the actual article, but it, it's nice to see that the Pope is resonating with lots of different folks. And Pope Francis has a way of attracting the attention of the general public, which puts him in circles that he might not otherwise be. I think it's interesting, though, because people call this Pope a rock star on the cover of the Rolling Stone. I mean, now he really is a rock star. Of course, I doubt that he ever sees himself that way. Yeah, I don't think so. Not at all. He's, uh, you know, still has his simple, humble way. But I don't think it's a bad thing that everyone is talking about him on social media. And how can our viewers connect with us on social well, media? Well, everyone can follow us on Twitter at EW, at EWTN News Nightly. And of course, uh, we have a Facebook page too. So please do join the conversation and let us know what you're thinking. Thanks for the great conversation with you, Susie Pinto. By the way, late this afternoon, the Pope's spokesperson, Father Federico Lombardi, did acknowledge that the magazine cover shows a diverse interest in the Pope, but he denounced the article's portrayal of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. He called it superficial journalism. Thank you so much for joining us. You can watch any segment or all of our news anytime you like on EWTN's YouTube page. We leave you this evening with a snapshot of the Walk for Life West Coast in San Francisco last weekend. Our photojournalist Paul Fifield was there. For all of us at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night. Uh, we are supporting um, pro-life because we believe um, killing an unborn baby is wrong. We're here because we love life. We uh, think it's atrocious that people would have the thought to kill babies inside the womb. And our message is adopt rather than abort. I hope that everyone everywhere sees that life is worth living and saving and the babies are precious and they need to live. I think more kids are have uh, more access to resources, especially with the internet and now that we have 3D ultrasound. Um, it's, there's no denying that that's life in the womb. I wanted people to stop abortion their babies. And just continue to stand up and vote for pro-life.